The executive committee of the Oregon country's second provisional government was elected by the people on May 25, 1844, and passed Oregon's first laws. Peter Burnett of the legislative committee developed a law that would prohibit Negroes and mulattoes from residing in Oregon or coming to Oregon. The goal was to make Oregon an all-white territory. The executive committee members, Osborne Russell, Dr. William Bailey and Peter Stewart all unanimously approved the legislation. The exclusion law would have negative ramifications for blacks in Oregon well into the 20th century, but small numbers defied the law and came to Oregon anyway as illegal aliens. Like the rest of America during the 1920s, Oregon was enthralled by the Roaring Twenties and the Golden Age of Sports. Technology was booming with ships, trolleys, automobiles, radios, airplanes, and other modern conveniences. Sports heroes like Jack Dempsey, Red Grange, and Babe Ruth were worshipped. Blacks were terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan. Black communities in Rosewood, Florida, and Tulsa, Oklahoma were destroyed by white mobs. It was in this environment that two black high school football players, Robert Shannon Robinson and Charles Edward Williams, nourished their mutual dreams of becoming college football players and medical professionals. Although Williams was born in Kansas City, Kansas, he had deep roots in Oregon from his childhood attending elementary school near Metzger Station in Tigard. The station was a stop on the Oregon Electric Railway line to Salem. Before he finished elementary school, his parents moved to Portland, where he finished at Selwood Elementary School before enrolling at Washington High School in 1918. His father, Archibald P. Williams, and his mother, Sadie Whittier Williams, eventually divorced, and she married Shelby Golden Sr. Mr. Golden built a home for the family on Southeast Sherritt Street. Robinson came to Portland from Temple, Texas in 1922 with his divorced mother, Florence Lofton. Compared to Temple, Texas, Portland was a large, busy city with a great amount of traffic in the downtown core. Florence's light complexion caused her problems in Texas and Oregon. In Texas, she and her husband Ulysses were arrested during their honeymoon on suspicion of violating Texas laws against interracial marriage. After releasing Robinson's parents, the sheriff told his mother she would be better off living her life as a white woman. Robinson and his mother found housing in an area of North Portland at 229 Cherry Street near the Willamette River and Broadway Bridge. This environment, with the river and the rain, was quite a contrast to their living environment back in Texas. The April 18th edition of the Oregonian newspaper alerted Portland's black community that the Klan was gaining respectability in the city. The newspaper reported that 1,200 of Portland's finest were initiated into the Klan at the municipal auditorium. Initiates included lawyers, physicians, businessmen, city officials, and prominent political figures. In Portland, it was common for some whites to frequently think Florence was a white woman who had a child by a black man when she was with her son. They persevered and lived as well as they could as minority blacks in Portland. Robinson enrolled at nearby Jefferson High School, where he would launch his historic athletic career as one of Oregon's few black athletes in a state where he was an illegal resident. Soon, Robinson met Charles Williams of rival Washington High School, and the two quickly became inseparable friends. Blacks in Portland experienced racial slurs and harsh stares on the streets of Portland. Signs that discouraged black customers from patronizing some businesses greeted them in the windows. Some read, we cater to white trade only, while others clearly noted that the business did not serve dogs, blacks, or Indians. The local Ku Klux Klan numbered in the thousands and seemed to shadow Robinson and Williams wherever they went. The Ku Klux Klan was organized in Oregon in 1921 and enjoyed the full support of many elected officials, including Portland Mayor George Baker. In 1921, Mayor Baker and other government officials posed with the Klan for a photograph after a meeting. The Klan presented itself as a thoroughly Christian group and enjoyed wide support that included some churches. The festive Rose Festival parade was often accompanied by fiery nighttime Klan initiations at Portland's Mount Tabor Park. By day, the park was a scenic welcoming environment, but by night, the Klan turned it into a stage for hateful speech. The Klan's history began with terror directed against blacks in the Deep South following the Civil War. 
but in Oregon, the most numerous targets of Klan hatred were Catholics and Jews. However, Oregon's small black population of several thousand were mindful of the Klan's danger to them. The same year the Klan was organized in Oregon, the Portland chapter of the NAACP sent anti-Klan Oregon Governor Ben Olcott a telegram, urging him to do what he could to protect the community. Early on, the Klan threatened black families who moved into white neighborhoods. Black ministers who had white church members were likewise threatened. Oregon's black community was resolutely against the Klan and made sure that the group knew that they were armed and prepared to defend their lives and property in Oregon. Despite the presence of the Klan, Robinson and Williams, like other youth in Portland, did the best they could to have a normal youth. Like other youth, they enjoyed the circus that regularly came to Portland. Ku Klux Klan influence became even more apparent on January 8, 1923, when the Klan's candidate of choice, Walter Pierce, was elected governor of Oregon. Further pressure came to Portland's black community when the controversial film The Birth of a Nation was shown to great reviews in Portland theaters, such as the Circle Theater. The film portrays the Ku Klux Klan as an heroic group determined to protect whites from the devious black race and was so offensive that the French eventually banned the film from being shown in France. The Birth of a Nation was lavishly termed an American institution and the New York Mail called it the supreme picture of all time. The 1923 football season was pressure-packed for both Robinson and Williams, on and off the field. They both wanted to make the All-Star team and strengthen their chances of winning college athletic scholarships. The weekly football games at downtown Portland's Multnomah Field were packed with thousands of enthusiastic fans, some of whom pelted Robinson and Williams with insults during their games. Some opposing players were particularly rough with them, but they both enjoyed the support of their teammates and excelled. Williams was particularly dominant on the field and seemed like a sure bet to make the all-star team. Robinson was several years younger, and while a very good player, he was not as dominant. No matter how much they loved football, they both began to realize that they were in imminent physical danger every time they played. Football's dangers became very clear to them on October 9, 1923, when the Morning Oregonian newspaper came out with an article about the death of a Negro college football player. The newspaper headline read, Two grid players killed. Iowa State Negro and Kentucky lad die from injuries. The Negro player was Jack Trice of Iowa State, who died from damage to his lungs when he was trampled by players from Minnesota during a game. Some felt the death was an accident, while others felt that it was a murder. The football season came to an end, with Williams leading Washington to the Portland Interscholastic League Championship after defeating Robinson and Jefferson for the title. Williams was named a first-team All-Star by the league coaches. Robinson was heartbroken that he did not make the team. Williams' coach had told him that the league's coaches had an agreement to have only one black player on the All-Star team at a time. Sports provided the most enjoyable recreational outlet for both of them since Oregon law allowed for segregation in public recreational venues, such as swimming pools and theaters. Chinese restaurants, such as the Republic Cafe and the black-owned Golden West Hotel, were two of the handful of businesses that would readily serve Portland's black community. The year opened with a highly organized Oregon Ku Klux Klan at its peak, with 35,000 members and numerous supporters. Oregon had the highest per capita Klan membership in the country. Before the summer of 1924, Marshfield, Oregon was primarily known to most Oregonians as a quiet little town on the West Coast that made its livelihood from mining, lumber, and shipbuilding. During the summer, a black man named Timothy Pettis was murdered in Marshfield, Oregon, and his genitals mutilated. No one was ever arrested or prosecuted for the crime. This was the second time that a black man had met with a violent death in Marshfield, Robinson and Williams were mindful of the situation, like most blacks in Oregon. Not long after the murder in Marshfield, Robinson had his life threatened during a game against Franklin High School at Multnomah Field. A male fan came down to the sidelines shouting, kill the N-word, after one of Robinson's spectacular plays. One of Robinson's teammates restrained him from physically confronting the man. The Oregonian newspaper reported the incident. 
The October 12th edition of the Oregonian newspaper carried news of the tragic death of former Portland Interscholastic League All-Star Ralph Holmes. In 1921, the dynamic Holmes was Portland's first dominant black high school football player. Holmes was a highly regarded role model for Williams and Robinson, as well as the rest of the community. He was noted for his work in the black community and his desire to help more black Americans settle in Africa. The Oregonian's glowing article noted that Holmes died of tuberculosis at the age of 22 after working on a ship that had taken him to Africa for a visit. Upon his return, he wrote a book about his travels to Cape Town, South Africa. In 1924, Williams had to quit school and work as a bellhop at the Portland Hotel. Despite the setback, he remained determined to finish high school and go to college. Robinson's mother left him in a Portland boarding house while she went to Seattle for better opportunities. Not being with her son made it possible for her to start a new life as a white woman. However, she continued to provide financial support for Robinson and would visit him from time to time. Throughout the year, Robinson lettered in basketball, baseball, and track. Because of his heart condition, he was not able to participate fully in the sprints, so he focused on the pole vault and high jump. Despite a great football season, Robinson was only selected as a second-team All-Star. This setback only strengthened his resolve to succeed. Williams left Portland to live with his maternal grandparents in Kansas City, Kansas, where he would finish high school. Robinson and Williams stayed in touch through the mail and by telephone. They often discussed their dreams of becoming big-time college football players and medical professionals. With his mother and Williams both gone, Robinson dug deep into his efforts to reach his goals. Portland's black youth spent recreational time at a segregated YWCA in North Portland, since many public facilities were segregated. Robinson could rely on his white teammates most of the time, but the white youth generally did not socialize with the black youth in Portland. Groups of white youth could be seen throughout Portland. Beatrice Kennedy and others associated with the local NAACP offered Portland's black youth support by providing black history and culture events throughout the year. Bobby's performance during the football season was dominant as he led Jefferson to the Portland Interscholastic League Championship and a first team position on the All-Star team. His dream was on schedule. All black people in Oregon were heartened in 1925 when the legislature passed a bill to eliminate the exclusion law. In 1926, Oregon voters overwhelmingly voted in favor of the bill, making blacks in Oregon legal citizens. The organized power of the Klan in Oregon was waning due to internal disputes and financial scandals. The Grand Dragon of Oregon, Fred Gifford, was caught up in various scandals and disputes that prompted him to formally resign in 1925. Robinson graduated from Jefferson High School, and the determined Williams graduated from high school in Kansas City, Kansas. This was a final step to fulfilling their football dreams. All of the hard work and dedication paid off when they were offered athletic scholarships by both Oregon Agricultural College and the University of Oregon. And this is a recruiter from Oregon State who came to pick him up. But they chose Eugene uh, partially because of an accident. But the, the coach McEwen and Bill Hayward, you know, the gentleman that Hayward Field is named after, these, these guys seem to be much more open uh, uh, to having African Americans. Oregon Agricultural College coach Paul Schisler was a progressive man who recruited them vigorously. He thought he had the upper hand on the University of Oregon because of Eugene's reputation as a Ku Klux Klan stronghold. The University of Oregon's coach, John McEwen, was also a progressive man who likewise recruited the pair. McEwen was a former All-American and head coach at West Point, as well as being a teacher in the English department. McEwen was an innovative coach who valued academics above athletics. As a Roman Catholic, he felt some of the same discrimination as Robinson and Williams. When McEwen was hired as head coach, the Medford Ku Klux Klan formally protested his hiring because he was a Catholic. University of Oregon President Arnold Bennett Hall rebuffed the Ku Klux Klan by telling them that he was hiring a coach, not a religion. The pair chose the University of Oregon in part because of a scheduling mix-up. They proudly made history when they accepted scholarships as the University of Oregon's first two black athletes.
Robinson and Williams boarded a train in Portland under the approving smiles of the black Pullman porters. They quietly sat in the back of the train until it arrived at the Eugene train station on Kincaid Street near Willamette Street, where they could look up and see the Ku Klux Klan cross on Skinner's Butte. In the recent past, hundreds of Klansmen had marched on Willamette Street in grand parades. Upon arriving at the campus, they could plainly see that they were just two blacks in a sea of some 3,000 white students. The only other blacks in the area were transients passing through. Despite the Chinese exclusion law and certain anti-Asian provisions of the Oregon Constitution, the largest minority group on campus were foreign students from the Philippines who had their own separate living quarters off campus. After registration, Robinson and Williams were told they would not be allowed to live in the campus dormitories with their new teammates because of their race. An apartment near campus at 825 East 13th Street was where they would live. Although the Klan was waning in Eugene, and the school generally did not approve of the organization, there were people associated with the Klan who worked for the school. Among these Klansmen were football team manager Jack Benefiel, and the head of the classics department, Frederick Dunn, who served as the exalted Cyclops of the Eugene clan number three. The head football coach prior to McEwen was Shy Huntington, who was a well-known Klansman. The clan in nearby Cottage Grove outlasted the Eugene clan and would hold meetings into the 1930s. Both Robinson and Williams were standouts on the freshman football team, despite the resentment of some teammates and fans who did not like seeing two blacks starting together in the backfield. They helped lead the freshman team to a 3 and one record. The only time they faced other players of color was when they played a game against the Chemawa Indian School from nearby Salem. Indian boarding schools were set up throughout the country to teach Indian youth what whites considered the superior qualities of Western civilization. Both Robinson and Williams were highly respected by their coaches and teammates during their freshman season. They were both considered to be top prospects for next year's varsity lineup. Despite the demands of football, they both took their studies very seriously, with Robinson majoring in biology and Williams majoring in zoology. Things were looking good as they moved closer to becoming varsity college football stars and eventually medical professionals. Like the other freshmen, they wore the mandatory freshman green caps, but they usually watched most of the joyful freshman events from a distance. There was the frosh parade, frosh bonfire, hazing, parties, paddling, and the exciting tug of war. The dances were a time when they would watch from a distance since there were not interracial parties or black girls to dance with at the school. Interracial dating was taboo, and interracial marriage was prohibited by Oregon law. Gradually, some of their teammates began to come to their apartment to socialize and study. This eased some of their feelings of isolation. Robinson and Williams moved around town with their new friends. They went to restaurants, movie theaters, and even fraternity houses. They socialized well with the fraternity members, even though they were not allowed to join a fraternity because of their race. Their athletic fame made them coveted dinner guests at some fraternities. Things continued improving as they won over more and more of their teammates with their character and stellar play on the football field. Even some of the avowed white supremacists began to warm toward the two. Coach Bill Hayward helped to arrange for them to play golf free at the Eugene Country Club in an effort to give them some additional recreational activities. One of the downsides to campus life was the blackface minstrel shows that featured white students singing and dancing as they mocked black people. Equally annoying were the cartoons of half-naked Africans that were at times displayed in student publications. 1927 would mark an historic improvement in race relations for the University of Oregon when the white football players petitioned the school administration to allow Robinson and Williams to live on campus in the dormitories with them. The administration reluctantly responded and built a separate apartment onto Friendly Hall with a separate entrance for them. Once inside the apartment, they had access to the rest of the dormitory where they could mix freely. The administration built the separate apartment because they wanted to avoid the appearance of full integration that might anger some in the community. In the fall, freshman Hubert Allen of Pendleton High School joined Robinson and Williams in Friendly Hall. Allen was the Oregon State High School champion in the high jump and high hurdles. The school now had three black athletes, which was a high number for a major college on the West Coast. 
The first game of the season was a non-conference game against Linfield College at Hayward Field. Robinson started at quarterback and Williams started at halfback. This historic moment marked the first time a black athlete ever started at a quarterback at a major college. Robinson led the team to victory with a 35-yard touchdown pass. Williams, as usual, provided steady, powerful running, blocking, and tackling. Some fans did not like seeing two blacks starting together and booed them while they played. Soon, fans and some alumni complained to Coach McEwen about the two of them starting together. As the season progressed, Robinson and Williams began to learn that they would usually only start together on road trips away from angry Oregon fans. Road trips were tough because Robinson and Williams were not allowed to stay in hotels with their teammates and had to be separated in other facilities that were open to blacks. Oftentimes, their teammates would defiantly sneak them into their rooms at night. Robinson's heart problems began to surface after he would make long runs. He would collapse and go into cardiac distress. Some fans booed him, thinking that he was showboating for attention. Bill Hayward and Williams would rush to his aid as he lay struggling to regain his composure. Brutal insults were hurled at Robinson by some fans who would sing Bye Bye Blackbird as he was helped off the field. The defiant Robinson would usually return to action after regaining his strength. Eventually, Robinson was attended to by a local doctor who diagnosed him with just an ulcer. He did not realize that Robinson had a heart defect that would kill him at the age of 47. The 1928 season would be the best in their young careers. The versatile and explosive Robinson played quarterback, receiver, defensive back, and punter. Williams was renowned for his power running and blocking in addition to his stellar play as a defensive back. He oftentimes played injured, prompting Coach McEwen to call him the toughest man he had ever known. They were now stars who were recognized on campus and generally well-treated, but there were times when they felt the racial slights. The joyous homecoming games attracted alumni from around the state. Prior to kickoff, the alums would march around the football field. The homecoming game against Montana was a time when Robinson and Williams were reminded of their status on campus. The winning homecoming poster was a painting of two half-naked Africans shaking hands. The Oregon State game on November 17th would be one of the few times that they would play against players of color. The Oregon State team had Henry Hughes, a native Hawaiian from Honolulu, and Coquel Thompson Jr., an Indian from the Siletz Indian Reservation in Oregon. Oregon won the historic game by a score of 12 to zero. Oregon was on its way to winning all of its games against Northwest teams. The victory over Washington was highlighted by a 24-yard touchdown pass from Robinson to Brunel and the hard short yardage running of Williams. The UCLA game in Los Angeles was one of the grandest, with UCLA's marching band providing pre-game and halftime entertainment. One of the highlights of the victory over UCLA was a 55-yard interception for a touchdown by Robinson. UCLA did not have any black players. The last two games of the season were in Hawaii. This would be the first time Bobby and Chuck would be allowed to room with their teammates on a road trip. In spite of this concession, Hawaii did have racial problems involving the native Hawaiians, Asians, and whites. The Hawaiian team consisted of native Hawaiians, Asians, whites, and a black player. Robinson led Oregon from the quarterback position with victories of a tough all-star from Honolulu and the University of Hawaii. Williams put his usual stellar job on both offense and defense. The remarkable season closed with an overall record of nine wins against just two losses. This was the best record in school history. Coach McEwen proudly proclaimed the team to be the undefeated champions of the Northwest and Mid-Pacific. The 1928 season was also remarkable because it was the first time two black women attended the University of Oregon at the same time. They were Nellie Franklin of Washington High School and Louise Lewis of Jefferson High School. In 1932, Franklin would become the first black woman to graduate from the University of Oregon. Neither woman was allowed to live in campus dormitories and had to live off campus. It was a common practice for black female students to live in private homes and sometimes work as domestic servants while attending school. The 1929 school year opened with anger and newspaper headlines challenging the University of Oregon to allow black female students to live in the dormitories. 
The fury began when Maxine Maxwell transferred from Oregon State and paid a deposit to live in Susan Campbell Hall. But when she appeared at the residence, she was told that black women were not allowed to live in campus housing. With the support of her parents, she protested to the school president and the Board of Higher Education to no avail. She refused to live in housing off campus and withdrew from school and returned to her home in Salem, the state capital, where her father had been receiving written threats from the Ku Klux Klan, warning him to get out of town. Robinson, Williams, and Hubert Allen remained in their campus apartment in Friendly Hall throughout the Fuhrer. Their presence in campus housing had not fully opened the door to the full acceptance of black students at the school. Black people throughout Oregon were disappointed in the outcome of the Maxwell incident, but were increasingly proud of Robinson and Williams as student athletes. Beatrice Kennedy, a lawyer, civil rights advocate, and an associate newspaper editor, published a feature article about Robinson and Williams in her community newspaper, The Advocate. Both young men aroused a great deal of pride in Oregon's black community. The game against the University of Washington in Seattle was one for the ages. Oregon won the game in part because of a sensational 92-yard interception return for a touchdown by Robinson. Robinson intercepted the ball deep in Washington territory, only to have Washington player Larry Westerweller, who was not in the game, rush onto the field and tackle him just before he could score a sure touchdown. After a big ruckus, the referees awarded Robinson the touchdown. On the way out of Seattle, Robinson and Williams could not help but notice a restaurant that was being prepared to open called the Coon Chicken Inn. The door to the restaurant was a giant Negro head with large lips and bulging eyes. This eyesore was another of the many insults they had to endure. Like the rest of the country, they were shocked when the stock market crashed on October 24th. The coming Great Depression made them worry about their ability to finance medical school after graduation. The November 23rd game against Hawaii at Portland's Multnomah Stadium would be just the second time Robinson and Williams would play against an integrated college team. The game program listed the race and ethnicity of the players. The player listings included Anglo-Saxon, Korean, Japanese, Hawaiian, and American Negro. The lone American Negro was End Donald Smith. After the season, his teammates voted him captain-elect for the upcoming season. Robinson was the star of the game when he scored the only touchdown to give Oregon a 7-0 victory. The University of Hawaii yearbook, the Kapalapala, described Robinson run in glowing terms by writing, the Oregon flash twisted and sidestepped his way 60 yards down the sideline to the only touchdown of the game. After the last game of the season, Coach McEwen gave the team great news when he told them that their outstanding season had earned them an invitation to play a game in Miami against Florida. The game was to be played on a neutral field instead of Florida's home field in Gainesville. The team was ecstatic about the upcoming game until they were told that Robinson and Williams would not be allowed to play because they were black. Florida, like other Southern colleges, would not play against black athletes and demanded that Oregon leave Robinson and Williams behind or they would not play the game. The white players were reluctant to play the game, but the administration and the coaching staff decided that the opportunity was too lucrative, so complied with Florida's wishes and decided to leave Robinson and Williams off the roster. Robinson and Williams were heartbroken. The last game of their careers was stolen from them. In a state of depression, they returned to Portland the weekend of the game. While walking downtown, they came upon the mother of one of their teammates. She asked why they were not in Florida for the game, and when they told her they were not allowed to play because of their race, she angrily said she hoped Oregon would lose the game. The game was a major event throughout Oregon and was broadcast by KGW Radio. Listeners could not only hear the game at home, they could hear it over one of KGW's radio trucks that was parked on the public streets downtown. Well, folks, here we go for the opening kickoff of the game between the University of Florida and the University of Oregon. The absence of Robinson and Williams, along with the absence of several other starters due to injuries and academics, 
contributed to the University of Oregon losing the game in the sweltering heat 20-6. This was the end of the historic football careers of Robert Shannon Robinson and Charles Edward Williams at the University of Oregon. With their scholarships completed and the hard financial times caused by the Great Depression, they had to give up on their dreams of financing medical school. Robinson got some consolation when he received mention as an All-Pacific Coast Conference selection. The 1929 University of Oregon yearbook paid tribute to him by writing, He will go down in history as one of the cleverest, fastest, and most versatile backs ever on a Northwest team. Williams did not get the flashy headlines like Robinson because he was asked to primarily block, power run, and tackle, but he was just as valuable to the team. Williams was well-respected throughout the Pacific Coast Conference as a top player. Coach McEwen resigned effective after the final game because of a contract dispute with a school president and took the head coaching job at Holy Cross. He later coached in the NFL. Robinson and Williams, like many top black college players, had no interest in attempting to play professionally in the NFL. The league's teams were located in small towns and had many white supremacists from the South on their rosters. Black players faced a great deal of open discrimination and the pay was low, requiring players to have a second job. Football was over. With their football eligibility completed, Robinson and Williams went on to the next chapters of their lives amid the Great Depression. Robinson was able to continue on scholarship when he began his college track career at Oregon under legendary coach Bill Hayward. He and Hubert Allen were the only blacks on the team. Robinson excelled in the pole vault, setting school and Northern Division records in the event as a great divisional champion. His best jump of 13 feet 7 inches was within 6 inches of the world record. In 1930, he earned All-American track honors when he placed second in the pole vault during the NCAA National Championships. He also set a Canadian pole vault record in a Canadian meet. Robinson was in and out of school between Los Angeles and Eugene in an effort to finish his degree. While finishing his degree, he was an active member of the University of Oregon's Multicultural Cosmopolitan Club. Robinson eventually finished his degree and moved to Los Angeles. Like many, he thought that Los Angeles and the bright lights of Hollywood would offer a more liberal environment for blacks, but under the shiny surface of Los Angeles, he found impoverished people and intolerance. In July 1933, the Nazis were holding open meetings in Los Angeles in plain view of the police and FBI. Robinson found work with programs in the black community that were designed to alleviate poverty. He held a variety of jobs that included modeling. He also met some of Hollywood's top black stars and politicians. His interest in art and photography brought him pleasure. Eventually, his work in the black community would find him branded as a black militant by some in the federal government and jeopardize his employment as a merchant seaman. Shortly after the outbreak of World War II, Robinson was drafted into a segregated unit of the Army but was discharged after a routine examination revealed his serious heart ailment. The long hours and stress of his work contributed to him having two failed marriages. Robinson died of heart failure on January 14, 1954, without ever having the family life he so greatly desired. Williams returned to Portland where he married and began raising two children. Initially, he was unable to find a job that would be expected for a man with four years of college because of job discrimination and the Depression, but he eventually secured a solid job with the state and continued his love of playing golf. Robinson and Williams opened the doors to the many black athletes who would follow them at the University of Oregon. Williams' brother, Shelby Golden Jr., was also an outstanding athlete and followed his footsteps to the University of Oregon, where he became the first black player with the University of Oregon golf team. Williams continued to contribute to the community and served as treasurer of the Portland chapter of the NAACP. He was also an active member of St. Philip's Episcopal Church. Life in Portland was slowly improving for black people as the Ku Klux Klan was in serious decline, but their lingering influence could still be seen and felt at times. The hatred the Klan helped to spread in Oregon was visible throughout much of Portland. In 1931, a Coon Chicken Inn was opened in Portland, much to the displeasure of the city's black residents. 
the eyesore would remain open in Portland until the 1950s. Williams died in Portland on March 17, 1977. Robinson and Williams, while often forgotten ducks, will ultimately be remembered for their character and strength that made it possible for them to contribute to American sports and civil life. In their special way, Robinson and Williams contributed to the University of Oregon and America in efforts to move society away from the darkness of racial prejudice into the light of social reconciliation.